It, uh, it was a Wednesday, and it was April, and our family had a pet cat named Zoe. And Zoe was not doing very well. Zoe had no appetite, no energy, and her conditioning was worsening. And I want to just pause for just a moment to address three things. The feedback, the fact that I've asked my family to tell this story and I got their permission. And number three, put your hand up if you are a pet owner. Okay, thank you. Uh, put your hand up if you are a dog owner. Yeah, that's who I want to talk to. <laughs> this is a story of a family pet cat. So I'm going to appreciate your patience as I continue the story. So it's decided that, uh, that we need to take the pet, Zoe, to the, to the, the vet. And so uh, the kids know that we're kind of tracking with this. And uh, Sophie's 13, Annie's 11, Benjamin is 7. And they've said their final goodbyes, because maybe something's going to have to happen at the vet. So um, Sophie's last words to me as I'm walking out the door, she says, it's OK, Dad, just don't cry. And off I go, and uh, I go and find the right vet. And sure enough, the vet gives uh, Zoe a, a, like a terminal diagnosis that uh, her condition is worsening, and it's, uh, we, have to, we have to put the cat down. So I call Beth and tell her that that's what's going to happen. And she's in agreement with that. So I do three things. I uh, sign the consent form, and I take a last picture of, of, of the cat, Zoe, and I cry. And then I come home, and as a dad, I've come home, and I am going to do something. I'm going to lead my family through this mourning process, and we're going to join everybody together in the family room, and we're going to talk about Zoe and some memories. And I'm going to tell them how the day unfolded. Every little detail. So that they can appreciate just how Zoe was cared for to the very end. So... I start with, you know, I had to go get Zoe, I had to get the little carrier, you know, it's her blanket, it's the red one, right? And so then I went and Mr., you know, Mr., he's the father of, like, Joey, it's his, it's, he's in your class, and he was willing to go with me, and he said he would drive, and I said, no, I will drive, and then I found the vet, and got lost the first time, and then the decision was made, and I called mom, and then the vet said, and all in that moment, Benjamin cries out, no! And the girls immediately go, no, no, it's okay, Benjamin. Zoe's no longer suffering. Benjamin says, no, it's dad. His story's taking too long. <laughs> I want to go sign and play. <laughs> now, why do I take the time to tell that story? Because I'm thinking a similar reaction is possible when you see that there's going to be one more message about Noah and the ark. John, your, your message is just taking too long. I want to grab a coffee in the lobby. In fact, I know the story. I could preach it for you, right? You preachers, it's right. Three points in a poem. Number one. God saves. Number two, God sends. God, number three, God promises. God saves Noah and his family in the ark. God sends a flood. And then God promises never to send that kind of flood again. How'd I do? <laughs> we are in a series with Emmanuel in the Old Testament. And the focus today isn't going to be so much about the dramatic narrative of the flood story, but a presence of Emmanuel in our circumstances. And that's what our focus is going to be today. The story of Noah and the flood is a disturbing one. It's a sobering one. It's a story of judgment. It's one that tells us about the depth of the depravity of man, how we've offended God with our sin. And yes, it's a story about death and destruction, but it's also a story about life and rebirth, about grace, and about undeserved mercy. 
And some of you have walked in here this morning carrying something, even though you're watching others with their smiling faces and you they just don't know what you're carrying. And maybe something you're carrying for yourself or it could be for someone else you love, you're married to, you're raising. And it's those circumstances that they're going through. And as one author said, holding on to God, when it appears God isn't holding on to you. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our story as we look at this. Because the story of Noah is our story. As the flood progresses, God becomes strangely absent. The words to Noah stop once he shuts those who've entered into the ark. And Noah has no way of telling how long he's going to be in the ark or wonders whether or not God has forgotten him. And it's in that moment where that story intersects with our story. So I invite you, if you would turn in your Bibles, to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And as you're turning there, a couple of statements uh, for those of you who are... Um, looking to read through the Bible in a year, as Pastor Daniel has uh, encouraged us to do. You may have just read this recently in your daily readings. And like I always like to say, I want to just acknowledge today all the authors, the commentaries, the different communicators who have assisted me in this with their insights, their phrasing, and how they have done this theme on Noah and the flood. And it's in this story that's very familiar to us. Sometimes things are emphasized, and you're like, why is that emphasized? Like, as you're reading along, like, why was that part mentioned? And I think there's two places that happens. Two places. The first one is, when God saw. The second one, when God remembered. That's our outline. Two points, no poem. Let's get started. When God saw. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. It's almost like it's the trailer to the movie that's coming. It tells you everything that's about to happen. It's the prologue. It's the reason why God is going to send the flood. It's right there in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Now, in that section, the contents of those four verses are arranged like this. Verse 5. What God saw. Verse 6, how God feels. Verse 7, what God intends to do. Verse 8, what God saw. Did you catch that? What God saw, what God saw, bookends this section. Verse 5, when God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth... When God saw, wait just a moment. That sounds familiar. Yeah, chapter 6, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, when God saw everything that he had made, good Bible word, behold, he saw that it was Good. Verse 31 of chapter 1, God saw it was good. Chapter 6, verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man. It was great. It was great. It was extensive and it was intensive. Extensive. Look at the text. In the earth. It's not something regional. The wickedness is not just right here. It is in the earth. It's on the earth. And from verse 5 all the way to verse 13 in Genesis chapter 6, eight different times it says earth. It's extensive. And it's not only extensive, it's intensive. 
Listen to how the narrator describes how wicked this is. When he saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, someone says, how wicked? And then they use seven different descriptors to tell you how wicked it is. Okay, pause. Some of you have children. Teenagers. <laughs> it's great, teenagers. Where are you going? Out, out where? Outside. With who? Friends. When will you be back? Later. <laughs> so how did it go? It was really good. How was it? No, no, really. It was really, really, really good. I got nothing from that. Seven so descriptions. How does this wickedness, like, how do you describe the wickedness? Check it out. Every intention, thoughts, heart, only evil, continually. If you're taking notes, good ones to circle. Every, without exception. Intentions, no restraint. Thoughts, the schemes, the heart, the place where the will, the emotions, the thoughts are. Only, nothing else, evil, no regard for justice, righteousness, honor, evil, and then continually from morning until night. Wow. Very encompassing, embracing verse to describe what God saw and how he described that wickedness. And then verse 6, how God felt. God was angry. God was very angry. Wait. Wait. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and it grieved his heart. <laughs> Man's wickedness grieved his heart, brought him sorrow. And it says there he experienced pain in his heart. Now, <laughs> the narrator of the story here is trying to find like human terms with their very limited scope to describe a God you can't understand. His character is beyond us. So he uses words like saw and was sorry and grieved in his heart. Again, acknowledging an attempt to describe who God is. Verse 7, based on the wickedness, how he felt, the sorrow that was there, what it God intends to do. So the Lord said, I will wipe out, I will blot out, I will destroy, I will blot out humankind whom I have created from the face of the land. Man, here they come, four sections, man, animals, creeping things, and the birds of the heavens. One more time, for I am sorry I have made them. God is going to eliminate the source of the problem. That's humankind, and that impact is very wide. It's going to include all the animals. What God saw, how he felt, what he intends to do, what God saw. Verse 8, but Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Another translation puts it, but Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. That's pretty good. God liked what he saw in Noah. Now, during all of this sort of negative assessment of mankind, there's still a ray of hope that somehow God is going to find a positive reference to Noah. It's right there. He is an individual with whom God can find and work with and find favor. And he's going to save him. Now, here's what's interesting. We're done. That's it. Verse 5, 6, 7, 8. That little package is done. Now, right next door to it is verse 9 and 10. Now, watch what the author didn't do. The author didn't sort of pick up verse 9 and put it after verse 7 before verse 8. What do I mean by that? Because verse 9 and 10, a little bit of the genealogy, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was three things. He was righteous. 
He was blameless, and he walked with God. Now, why don't you take those three little descriptors, pick them up, bring them over here and drop them here, which means, so all of this negativity, God is going to destroy, but I need to find someone. Let's, he's looking, he's looking. Wait, I see someone whose righteousness and obedience I'm going to work with. It's his good merit that wins him favor with me. Oh, no, no. They didn't switch the way that. It's very much showing us that his righteousness, that is Noah's, and his obedience has nothing to do that God chose him. There's nothing to that merit of Noah. It's very intentional. God saw and found favor. And oh, by the way, these are his generations and three statements about Noah. Righteous, blameless, walks with God. And the names of the sons. Because if you would have switched it, it would have changed the whole focus of what that is. Small, important. Two points to this message. When God saw, Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 8. When God remembered, Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. When God remembered, four words, but God remembered Noah. Pause. Have you ever been remembered? Uh, I have. Our family, we have three kids, and uh, they... We're on, we're on a road trip. We're going to go down this summer to pick up Annie in North Carolina in the cherry red van. And we're driving down and we're stopping in West Virginia. And we all agree that we're going to go into the rest area and we're going to use the, the restroom and then we're going to come out. Beth says, I will now drive this leg, next leg. I said, great. And so we all go our separate ways. So I go in and I, I'm like, I guess old school, whatever, or maybe just old. And I pick up a paper map. And I'm looking as I walk out of the rest area. And the red cherry van is not there. <laughs> and I'm wondering why the red cherry van has been moved. And I start to look a little closer into the parking lot. And it's <clears throat> not there. And neither is my cell phone, and neither is my family. And I'm glad I have a paper map to say, you are here. <laughs> and then I look way down, just before, as they say in the United States, the interstate, just before they get on the interstate, and sure enough, there's two tail lights and the red van is backing up. Beth, <laughs> here's Sophie, <laughs> say to Benjamin, Benjamin to Sophie, what about dad? <laughs> and Beth, checked her rear view mirror, the changeover, thought dad was with the stuff, with the blankets, you know, whatever the pillow, in the very back of the van, resting comfortably, and she was gonna just drive from there. I got permission to tell that story as well. <laughs> but God remembered Noah. <laughs> now, this is not to imply that somehow God had forgotten Noah, that he had to recall Noah's situation. God has never remembered anything because God has never forgotten anything now how could God who remembers but he can't remember how can he do that because he never forgets and for us to look at that we're going to look at what the structure 
of this section of this story of Noah with its four big chapters and we see how the author wants to say this is the biggest part of the story this whole story of Noah is all about how God remembered and because God remembered God is actually going to act on your behalf Noah that is to say there's symmetry to the story it falls into two halves first half is here second half is there in the first half, you will have some kind of a part of an element to the story, something, an aspect, a, an episode, something to do, and it's going to be here, and it's going to be exactly matched. It's going to match with a corresponding feature on the other side. They do it all the time because they want to make sure that the most important part is in the middle. It's a literary technique. You see it all the time. They want to make sure that you understand that what's important is in the middle. So what's in the middle of all this story is that God remembered Noah. It happens all the time. If I say, John goes on a run, a run John goes on, first half, John runs, run John. In the middle is the most important part. You just see how it just balances everything out. This whole side here is just going to funnel right into the most important part, which is God remembered Noah, and then it's going to funnel out in reverse order. What do I mean by that? Let's look at four different kinds of aspects. Transitions, speeches, instructions, and floodwaters. Transitions. Let's frame the whole story. It's a long story. Let's start with an opening. Let's start with an opening, and we'll call it verse 9 of chapter 6, and we'll say that in that moment, we can say that we're going to introduce the story. And the story opens with, these are the generations of Noah, and we've been to that verse, and it lists his things, and it sets it all up, and then in that moment, there is a corresponding one at the other end, and that is in verse nine, or 19 of chapter 9. Let's shut this story down. Let's bring it to a close, and sure enough, the transition is there, verse uh, 18 and 19 of chapter 9. The sons of Noah, who went forth from the ark, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 19, these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. These two aspects framing the whole story. And then it moves in one step closer as we talk about number two, speeches. Two very important speeches of God. God's decision to destroy, God's decision to preserve. God's decision to wipe out the earth. We see that in verse 13 of chapter 6. I have determined to make an end of the flesh, all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence. Through them, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God's intention and what he's going to do. He tells Noah that's what he's going to do. That part of the story matches a corresponding aspect of God's decision on the second half. God says, I am now going to preserve order. I am going to tell you, Noah, that you need to be fruitful and you need to multiply and that I won't send a flood again and that I will establish a covenant with you and as a sign, I give you a rainbow. God's decision to restore the earth. We've got a transition, we've got a speech, and now we have instructions. The story is full of instructions. Well, uh, Noah, this is how you're supposed to build the ark. It's this measurement. Make it out of gopher wood, says the King James Version. Why did I say gopher? Because I'd like to speak, uh, use a sermon and actually say the word gopher in a message one day. Lots of instructions about how to build the ark. But there's two very specific instructions. Noah, verse 7, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, chapter 7. Noah, you have to enter the ark. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your household. That instruction has a corresponding aspect on the other side. Noah, you may now leave the ark. We see that in chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. Then the Lord said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. And then the last one, the flood waters. If 
first half here, second half there. Floodwaters are prevailing. They're rising, chapter 7, verse 18. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the water. The good news is there's a corresponding one that matches on the other side, chapter 8, verse 3, and the waters begin to recede. And it's in that moment, but God remembered Noah, that in that decisive moment, God marks that he will now put a stop to the forces of destruction and initiate new life. Everything changes. Everything. There's this great hope and sense of optimism as we move into this area of life as God provides that for us. And they begin to recede. But God remembered Noah. Now, there are different verses that you can find in Scripture about how God remembers. In fact, I'd love to call this message the four best words in the entire Noah story. I have my slide already. Got the date on it already. Talk to Daniel. Daniel says you've got to work at Manuel in there somewhere. What does Daniel know? He's sleep deprived. Congratulations again, Daniel, Laura. Maybe Daniel is so sleep deprived he won't remember that. God remembered isn't the only time it's used in the Bible. This pivotal statement is used in other places. And when the Bible says God remembers someone, or a covenant with someone, it means that he's going to get ready to act on that person's behalf. And so we see God remembering in Genesis chapter 19. God remembered Noah, sorry, God remembered Abraham when he rescued Lot and removed him from that city of destruction on the plain. In Genesis chapter 30, God remembered Rachel remembered her prayers and gave her children. She gave her Joseph and Benjamin. Exodus chapter 2, God remembered the children of Israel. God remembered them because he remembered what? The covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he brought them out of slavery. Numbers chapter 10, God remembered the children of Israel and he rescued them from their enemies because God heard the alarm of the sound of the trumpets and God rescued them from that. Isaiah chapter 49, Isaiah reminds us that God remembers his children how like a child, pardon me, like a mother remembers a child. The New Testament picks up on this theme and gives us the ultimate significant remembrance and that is the birth of Jesus when Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 the father of John the Baptist speaks a blessing a promise that the Messiah will come because what God remembered his covenant with his people When we think about God remembering in this Noah story and the other stories I just described, it reminds us that the biblical pattern is that when God remembers someone, it means he's going to act on their behalf because God, Emmanuel, is what? He is a God, and you know this in your own life, he's a God who is compassionate, he's proactive, and he's attentive. And I'm not sure if that's moved from your head into your heart, but I'd like to try to demonstrate it here this morning. I'd like to ask, if you are currently in the midst of of incredible, difficult circumstances, and you are experiencing God's presence and His sustaining grace, I'm going to invite you to please stand where you are if you're able. 
And then I'm going to ask if you have actually in the past have experienced God's presence and his sustaining grace. I'm going to invite you also to stand. And then I'm going to ask you also, maybe there's someone here today that would like to experience that. And as you're standing, what you're doing is you're giving evidence to others that God remembering me that's also available to you. I'm going to invite everyone to please stand with me. We spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. Let's finish off in the New Testament with a verse of benediction from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us the Evil Alliance Church. Let us approach God's throne with certainty, with confidence. Why can we do that? The barrier has been removed because of what Jesus has done for us. We can now go to that throne and we can do what? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Will you join with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your word, that you've preserved it. The truth of your word. And that uh, we can testify in our own lives that you have been faithful to us. And the different worship songs that led into this, that your steadfast love carries us. We've never been left alone. We thank you for that. Thank you for those who can testify that you have been their sustaining presence in their life. And Lord, we, we don't go alone. We thank you for the community of Unionville. Thank you for family. And so, Lord, as we leave today, may we have a renewed sense of the hope into your promise that you see us and that you remember us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing. <laughs>